Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to come to you today and to talk about fatal blood clots. And it's very, very important that when patients have surgery or are hospitalized, that they're interrogated properly to find out about their risk factors. And you'll see this shirt in the background that is talking about never treat a stranger, never kill a friend. And what it's all about is that once you meet somebody that you're going to treat, put in the hospital or operate on, you've got to find out a lot about them in order to protect them. And of course, once you do that, you would never kill a friend because you'd protect that friend and you would also never treat a stranger. Now, among the most important things regarding uh, finding out about risk assessment is family history. And it's absolutely critical and often not properly queried, especially during an emergency situation. So I'd like to share with you this picture of a fatal pulmonary embolus. And this is an autopsy, and you can see the, the pulmonary arteries and bifurcation are clogged with clots, which resulted in the death of this patient. Now, after all these years and all of this research, PE mortality is increasing over the past decade. Why? We have enough data and the algorithm to prevent these the majority of these deaths. Uh, here is one example of the most powerful data. And this is 23,000 surgical patients that were treated either with heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And the endpoint was autopsy adjudicated fatal pulmonary emboli. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as you can see, a tenth of a percent, tenth of a percent of these patients uh, died of a fatal pulmonary embolism, so that pulmonary emboli can be prevented well over 99% of the time using uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. The uh, treatment period was seven days. And the other thing is prophylactic doses of anticoagulation uh, don't cause death. Death is a rarity, but not giving them when they, they're needed can cause death. And again, all patients relieve, received at least seven days of anticoagulant prophylaxis. Hi, Emily. I just wanted to tell you that I love you and I miss you today. A daughter is a mother's best friend. Our daughter, Emily, was a UNF graduate and a rising star in healthcare. She was treated for a fractured ankle at Mayo Clinic. She died from a pulmonary embolism stemming from that fracture. Find out the answer to this simple question. What is my caprini risk? This simple question could save your life. Unfortunately, this young lady had a strong family history of blood clots, which given the emergency and the fracture and so forth, was never queried. If it had been queried, she would have gotten anticoagulants and there would have been less than a, a half a percent chance of her dying of this clot. Now, the... What is the Caprini score? We'll we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that later, but the uh, it's a thorough history and physical. Now, believe me, it's not the only road to Rome. However, it is a, a 40 element query of a patient. And we know as the number of risk factors goes up, the incidence of blood clots goes up. We know that these risk factors are at different powers. Uh, bed rest is a low power. Uh, risk factor, whereas cancer is a high power risk factor. Taking the number of risk factors combined with their power results in a score. And that score is a nonlinear increase in clinical blood clot rate with increasing score. As the score goes up, the incidence of blood clots goes up. Here's this the uh, picture in general surgery from one of the early studies. And at the present time, this uh, uh, risk score has been validated in over 5 million patients in more than 420 publications worldwide. And I'd like to say my hats off to people all over the world who have worked on this with me. They've helped me refine it, helped me make it better, helped criticize it when it needed to be uh, criticized and so on and so forth. And here we see that the VTE incidence in various surgical populations varies. In gen and and in with a pop with a score of about uh, five, then around one percent of people get a clot, uh, even less in the uh, 
head and neck population, a, l- a little more in the Vietnamese population. And I'm, I must acknowledge my hats are off to the Vietnamese because they have scored 200, 2,795,000 patients in four Hanoi hospitals over a two year period. And those results are very good and they illustrate this problem. Now, I want to point out the fact that when the score is greater than eight, that the score, the incidence of blood clots jumps. Look at these figures, six and a half percent, 18 percent in head and neck surgery, whereas with a score of five to six, it was only nine tenths of a percent. So it's very important to score these people and to look at their highest scores. Let's see how that really works. Here's a 42 year old woman on birth control with a BMI of 29. She has three risk factors. The Caprini score is three. Here's another patient, 76 years of age, with a history of pulmonary embolism and past cancer. Three risk factors. However, the score is eight. So although each patient has three risk factors, the combination of number of risk factors and their power result in a more accurate estimate of VTE risk compared to a simple list of risk factors alone. Now, what about family history? It's a, it's a risk indicator for a first venous thrombosis, regardless of the other risk factors identified. In clinical practice, family history may be more useful for risk assessment than thrombophilia testing. Family history is associated with a high incidence of thrombosis, and failure to know this, op- this information may result in a serious or fatal pulmonary embolism postoperatively, just in like the unfortunate young lady, Emily, that we just showed a uh, video. Now, a large study in Scandinavia, which goes back to 2013, shows that the risk of blood clots in a patient that has a family history not a personal history, but a family history, varies according to the degree of, of, of relatives, but it exists in decreasing order from first, second, and third degree relatives. And even in people that live together, uh, if one gets a clot, there's a, some slight association, and that may be related to lifestyles. Now, here is a follow-up of that study from 2024 in 482,000 pedigrees, and between that and the offspring were a three quarters of a million people. And then they were able to divide the pedigree into eight different clusters, depending upon the incidence of VTE. So different VTE rates and manifestations could be seen with these different clusters of the family history, depending on how close they were to the patient involved. And family vulnerability to VTE is in broad and impacts other conditions, including thrombophilia, obesity, gout, varicose veins, and arterial thrombosis. The the genetic risk factors together only account about 30% of a family history of VTE. So whatever risk score you're using, and certainly there are other risk scores, there's many roads to Rome, but you must ask about family history and all degrees of relatives if you want to really interrogate that stranger and make them your good friend. Now, what is the missing link? Family history is frequently not asked preoperatively, especially during an emergency event. If you're in an auto accident, if you have serious COVID and you're having trouble breathing, that's not a good time to try to find out if Aunt Tilly had a blood clot. It just doesn't work that way. There's too many things going on. So I've had the good fortune to become involved with Professor Atu Ladu and his associates from the Global Thrombosis Forum who've set up, this is a, a not-for-profit organization that was set up in honor of uh, one of Ladu, the Ladu family's uh, offspring that uh, suffered from a fatal pulmonary embolism as a young person. And here is a statement. The idea of this program is to teach high school students more about medical issues. And here is a quote from these four students. We are the high school students and members of the Global Thrombosis Forum, affiliate of the North American Thrombosis Forum. Our mission is to spread awareness of thrombosis in the community. We conduct research present and present and publish our work to share knowledge of thrombosis. 
One of the initiatives was using the Caprini risk score to increase awareness in the community. And this was a project in two phases. These students were asked to view a video, and give it to their respondents. So I'm gonna show this video now. These days, we have all sorts of technological tools. We have MRIs, we have CAT scans, we've got all these different blood tests. What is really the forgotten art is the history and physical. And the Caprini score is nothing more than a good history and physical, where all the risk factors for blood clots are enumerated and then put together in a score to determine what the patient needs for protection for them to be safe and not suffer a fatal blood clot. 
The Caprini score ideally should be first collected by the patient. When you go to the dentist, you have to fill in your health history. Why not when you go to your surgeon? Following that, then you go to the hospital and that, that form can be checked, certain items can be checked, and then that, that can be the initial score. But it's not the end of the road. The Caprini score is dynamic. And as the hospitalization goes along, people oftentimes, unfortunately, develop infection, they need central lines, they get pneumonia, they have to be reoperated. All of those things increase the risk of blood clots. So then by the time you go home, there should be a final tally. And that final tally then used to calculate whether or not you need ongoing anticoagulants for your protection for blood clots, especially during the first month after surgery. So after viewing these two videos, people that were participating in this study, the, the students, um, viewed the videos with their family because this is part of this is an educational uh, initiative uh, in the quiet of your home and utilizing uh, uh, children and grandchildren networking with their parents and grandparents because uh, that's the ideal way to collect information. And all of the data blindly was put into a secure database. And here is the risk assessment form. It's a patient-friendly form. Uh, it's available on my website, which will show you the, the details later. And th the astonishing thing about this study was that 26% of the respondents in over 2,000 patients indicated there was a family history of thrombosis. We've never been able to collect that kind of data in clinical practice, but it's that networking with the students, the parents, the grandparents all together that everybody's trying to do a good job so that the, the children get a good mark and so on and so forth. And here we see the Caprini scores who have a family history of blood clots. And in clinical practice, as I say, never more than one to 2% of this family history is usually elicited. Now, patients older than 75 would need prophylaxis even for simple procedures because the 70, over 75-year-old patients have a score of eight to begin with. And here are the references for these studies. So this was a very successful uh, program that uh, empowering the, the high school students. And in conclusion, this Global Thrombosis Forum represents a powerful educational tool for students at an early age, empowering them with good scientific data and methods that will last a lifetime. The unique feature of students gathering data and listing families to help their young ones gather valuable risk assessment facts has the potential to save lives by further educating the public before they get sick, before their surgery, before there is an accident. And the program going forward is now being expanded to include college students, pre-med students, and we're enlisting sites everywhere in the world. And remember, never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. Performing a thorough history and physical to somebody you meet and you're gonna operate on or put in the hospital, it gives you knowledge about their patients if they were a good friend. And of course you would never, never, kill a friend and never treat a stranger. Here is my social media sites, uh, including my website. And uh, this is the home screen of the website. You can take your risk assessment, ask a question, or go to the resource center. There's over 400 articles or abstracts using the Caprini score uh, on the resource center. And in addition to that, there's a hundred, over 130 videos that you can view right on my site. So I'd like to thank everybody for uh, listening to this, uh, and I uh, hope you all have a great day.